Many years ago, Charles Oliveira's father presented each of his sons with a stone, a gift that Charles still treasures to this day. This stone was symbolic of David and Goliath. In the Old Testament, the Israelites and the Philistines were poised for battle, but the Philistines offered the type of resolution that legends are made of. Each side could spare the masses, instead selecting a single champion to represent them. The stage could not be set in any more of a grandiose and poetic manner for a hero to step into the story. But that hero was hard to find, because Goliath, the champion of the Philistines, was not an ordinary man. He was a giant. The Israelites feared Goliath and felt the behemoth represented certain defeat. None would accept the challenge. That is until David, a young boy, stepped up. David had faith in God and believed he would be delivered the victory. You told him, I don't have nothing but a prayer. Well, chump, all I need is a prayer, because if that prayer reached the right man, not only will George Fulman fall, but mountains will fall. Então, tipo, eu acreditei, eu tive fé, mano. Eu tive fé que ia dar certo. The contest between the two was not a fight of the night. Instead, David loaded up his sling and unleashed a stone, fatally striking Goliath on the head. It's obvious that Charles' father was trying to tell his son, you can be David in this life. But in order to understand the fitting and prophetic nature of this gift and why it is of such sentimental value to Charles, we need to understand Goliath, which is in this story, the enormous, seemingly insurmountable challenges that Charles Oliveira was born into, because the odds were never in his favor. Nada, nada nesse mundo vai me bater mais forte do que a vida já me bateu. Not all favelas are equal. Those of São Paulo don't quite have the same history of violent government interventionism as Rio. They are, however, plagued by many of the same problems, all largely originating from the same harsh reality. Brazil is the democratic country with the highest concentration of income in the top 1%. Outside Africa, it has the highest Gini coefficient in the world, which is a measure of inequality within a given area. And in Brazil, this steep divide manifests itself in atrocious living conditions or crowded favelas, often positioned on the cusp of luxurious neighborhoods. Here's a very famous image of São Paulo, and you can see a clear delineating line here. A cidade de São Paulo é tão desigual que a taxa de mortalidade infantil em um bairro pobre chega a ser 20 vezes maior do que é registrada nas regiões centrais da cidade. Quem mora na periferia de São Paulo morre até 23 anos mais cedo do que os que vivem em áreas mais centrais da cidade. Os 23 anos a menos de vida em áreas periféricas deixam essas regiões com uma expectativa de vida menor do que em países pobres, a exemplo do Congo, na África. But aside from jarring photography, the Gini Index has serious significance in predicting sociological trends. In fact, it's a better predictor of crime than is absolute poverty, which makes sense. You know, some people are poor, but they are at least spared the constant reminder of that fact. In Brazil, because of a cruel twist in topography, they are constantly reminded. Favelas are often perched in the hills, looking down on the excesses of the wealthy, so these people cannot escape it. I'd have to imagine that as you look out from the favelas, you must at times be struck by the idea that life is the flip of a coin, and you lost that task the day you were born, in the most unforgiving manner. It's a big club, and you ain't in it. You and I are not in the big club. The divide is present in every facet of life, healthcare, education, housing, and law and order. Moradores de bairros mais distantes do céu esperam em média 75 dias para passar por uma consulta com o um clínico geral na rede pública de saúde. Que onde o serviço público mais é necessário com qualidade é onde ele mais está ausente. But above all, the chasm between these two worlds is a chasm of opportunity. There are those for whom real opportunity exists and those for whom it simply does not. Esse desequilíbrio que existe entre as faixas é, de maior poder aquisitivo e menor, distribuição de renda. O brasileiro, ele está muito inseguro, o povo, por causa dos políticos. O governo, os políticos, né? 
deputado, prefeito, eles, corrupção, eles pegam o dinheiro e vai gastar com iate. É, vi... And this chasm of opportunity is very much the Goliath Oliveira would have to overcome in his life. Charles Oliveira comes from Guarujá, a beautiful getaway for São Paulo's wealthy, who occupy the luxurious beachfront condos on a seasonal basis. But not far from all this lavishness lie the cramped slums of Guarujá's deeply impoverished favelas, two disparate worlds, cruelly positioned side by side. <laughs> Many families survive on $50 a month in makeshift houses without access to basic amenities like sewage and running water. As you can imagine, crime and gangs run rampant. In 2013, Guarujá had the highest rate of robberies in the state of São Paulo. A year later, there was roughly one robbery per hour, which is obscene for a city of 300,000. There's probably instances of a guy committing a robbery and then he himself getting robbed on his way to the pawn shop, playing past the parcel with some yuppie cell phone. Até na nossa equipe acompanha com exclusividade a ação da Polícia Militar aqui no Guarujá. Dois latrocínios em menos de 48 horas e agora a gente acaba de receber a informação de que um corpo foi deixado atrás da delegacia sede do município. In 2016, the city set a new record, but not in a good way. 22 kidnappings in a single weekend. So this gross inequality breeds gangs, drugs and crime. And of course, a senseless loss of life. The situation is dire. But what Charles may have lost in terms of the socioeconomic flip of the coin, he made up for in terms of having some really amazing people around him. Although he identifies deeply with it, Charles never actually lived in a favela because his grandmother offered up part of her house to his family. It was beyond cramped conditions, very humble abode, but it saved them from living in the favela. Charles regards his parents as his heroes, and when you look at what they did, they are superstars in this story. Charles' career is notable as being one of the longest, toughest grinds to success we've ever seen. But that's almost appropriate because from an early age, he has watched his parents resolutely grind for survival. Their life was a constant battle. What's most shocking here is that these people work non-stop to just keep their family's head above water. A punishing existence. Imagine trying to raise a family in this environment. Se eu falar para você passei fome, eu nunca passei fome, mas eu tinha sala tinha para dividir para três pessoas. Eu comia aquele negócio, ficava um pouquinho ali de fome, queria que tal, tal. Minha mãe trabalhava em dois lugares, meu pai em dois lugares. Minha mãe nunca, minha mãe não sabe nem ler nem escrever. Minha mãe trabalhava de faxineira numa escola e ela saía da escola, ela trabalhava de faxineira na casa dos donos da escola. Meu pai trabalhava na feira vendendo ovos, meu pai trabalhava no matadouro. Tipo, então você vê a loucura todo dia. Uh -huh. Passei de manhã com a minha mãe e chegava no final da tarde. Charles said there was always just enough food for everyone, but sometimes there wasn't enough for everyone. And his father 
would make the sacrifice. Eu nunca passei fome, meu pai nunca deixou a gente passar fome. Porém, eu já tive vontade de comer, já não tinha. Meu pai, ah, não quero tomar, eu já comi, meu pai não tomou, meu pai, meu pai não tinha tomado café. Because his parents were always working, his mother was terrified. She didn't want her sons getting gobbled up by the favela and spit into an early grave. Our life of crime. As Charles now knows, she was totally justified in her concerns. Não, essa era a preocupação da minha mãe, né? Perdi amigos por crime, infelizmente alguns morreram, outros estão presos. Conheço ainda pessoas que vivem disso, escolheram isso. Idle hands make the devil's work, so his parents' instinct was to keep their sons busy in sports. Mas a minha mãe sempre se preocupou em colocar a gente no meio do esporte. Então, mano, eu fiz karatê, eu fiz natação, eu fiz judô, fizemos boxe. A gente fez de tudo um pouco porque minha mãe tinha a preocupação, né, da gente estar tá na vida errada, tal. Então, these people were really killing themselves to eke out the most humble existence whilst trying to steer their sons through a myriad of potentially deadly pitfalls. Unbelievable life and the sacrifices made for him and his siblings have not been lost on Charles. Não posso reclamar do meu pai e da minha mãe, porque fizeram muito por, por, pela gente, por isso que hoje eu mato e morro por eles, faço tudo por eles. These were already extremely poor people, but as they say, your health is your wealth. So you can probably guess where this story is headed. Straight to the hospital. At seven, Charles was struck down with a number of conditions that not only threatened to end any participation in sports, but actually threatened to send him to a wheelchair. And Charles spent two years in hospital, much of that time with a weeping mother by his side. These problems persisted for many years, with regular injections. He eventually told his father he would rather die than live a limited life. He felt healthy, and so he abandoned the treatment and instead placed his faith in God. Se eu vou morrer, eu vou morrer. A couple of years after leaving hospital, a family moved into the neighborhood. Charles and his brother befriended the two kids, who were enrolled in jiu-jitsu. Oliveira's family didn't have the money for classes, so Paulo, the father of those kids, took Charles and his brother along and requested that they train for free. E tipo, o moleque nós vivia na, tipo, ali naquela loucura e tal, acabamos conhecendo, acabamos indo, e ele falou assim, ó, oh, posso levar esses moleques para treinar jiu-jitsu e tal? The instructor evaluated the kids, thought they had some talent, and agreed to give them a scholarship of sorts. This is one of those lucky breaks. Paulo's instinct to mentor and his act of kindness completely altered the trajectory of Charles' life. Now we've seen it many times. These people make all the difference in the world in these types of high-risk environments. This was a huge moment in Charles' life, who immediately had some clarity on what his future might look like. Desde quando eu cheguei, eu já me apaixonei, falei, mano, é isso mesmo que eu quero fazer. Tinha uma mesa, tinha umas revistas e tipo, tava lotada a academia assim. Eu falei, é, vou aparecer nessas revistas aí e tal. E tipo, a galera falou, mano, esse moleque é louco. <risos> Unfortunately, a couple of years later, Paulo became an example of the type of horrific outcomes he was trying to steer those kids away from. He became another body, senselessly gunned down in the street. Charles speaks about Paulo often in sentimental terms, but what was about to transpire in Charles' life is probably the greatest tribute he could pay to man and the greatest testament to the positive impact Paulo had on his life. Não é qualquer um que faz luta. Então você tem que gostar disso, você tem que ter prazer nisso. Eu tenho prazer nisso. Eu gosto de lutar. Porra, nem deu tempo de descansar, mas isso aí, lutador, a nossa vida é essa lutar, então eu estou muito feliz com isso. This is gonna be good. Head kick from De Silva immediately. Nice right hand by Stanko. Oh, De Silva's got his leg locked up. Can he turn it? Back to their feet. He's got feet. double underhooks. Stanko's a very strong opponent, and De Silva's moving position to position like nothing. He's got that choke sunk in. Wow. Wow, well, this, this Garb, I'm going to head up to the cage to talk to Charles Oliveira De Silva. Oliveira's jiu-jitsu progressed to a formidable level, winning many medals in tournaments in São Paulo. And at 18, he began to train MMA. In his first year training, one of the fighters in his gym pulled out of a Grand Prix at Welterweight. And although there was other fighters available, his coach felt Charles was ready. And Charles was ready. Fight, fight, fight. Three fights in one night. 
barely weighing 155 pounds, Charles won the welterweight Grand Prix as an 18-year-old replacement, finishing all three opponents two by knockout. For his efforts, he collected 3,000 real, which in 2008, that was close to $1,800. Big money in the favela. Irmão, era muito dinheiro. Era muito dinheiro. Tô rico. Não, eu falei, falei, mano, eu tô rico, foi isso. Initially, his mother was disgusted. She hated the idea of Charles participating in a violent sport, and she wanted nothing to do with the money. E aí, quando eu cheguei em casa, eu queria fazer, ajudar, e minha mãe, não, não quero, é seu dinheiro, não sei o que, tal, tal, tal. Passei no mercado e comprei tudo aquilo que eu podia comprar de comida. Foi isso que eu comprei. Com meu primeiro dinheiro. Cheguei em casa, falei, mano, sei que essa tá brava, mas tá aqui, a gente vai ter várias coisas agora, tal, não sei o que, tal, tal. Later that year, Charles entered another Grand Prix and again emerged victorious with two knockouts. Então, na maioria das lutas, eu, eu nocauteava os caras, nem eu acreditava. This time, as the prize, he was offered either 5,000 real, which was close to $3,000, or a brand new motorcycle. At 18 years old, the idea of riding around a favela on a brand new bike, picking up chicks, was tempting. Eu queria pegar a moto. Falei, pô, cara, vou pegar a moto, vou ter a moto. But out of a sense of obligation, he ultimately took the money. Só que eu pensei na família, eu falei, eu prefiro de pegar o dinheiro. Now, taking the money was a total no-brainer. But 18-year-olds, they often have no brains. So he showed some good instincts there. Having never made a cent from jiu-jitsu, Charles now understood fully that this was how he could help his family. And he could not be dissuaded. His mother, began to relent. Porque eu lutei, eu lutei jiu-jitsu a vida inteira, né, assim. A vida inteira. Nunca ganhei um real na vida. Meu pai já entendia, meu pai falou, não, é isso, e a mãe começou a entender. E aí eu comecei a ver que o MMA era aquilo que ia fazer a gente ter algo melhor, sabe? Poder comer melhor, poder se vestir melhor. Pô, mas assim, eu, eu tinha roupa porque as pessoas davam. But that wasn't the end of their financial woes. Charles would go on to amass a perfect 12-0 record in Brazil, with 11 finishes. But the promoters, would often just not pay the guy. Even more ruthless than that, multiple managers who wanted to work with Charles would send him fake UFC contracts just to keep him on the hook. Now, that is cold-blooded, dangling in front of him a better life for him and his family just to manipulate him. Sadistic behavior. Sabe aquele, sabe quando você teve muitas, tipo, você foi enganado muitas vezes? Eu fui enganado muitas vezes de contrato. Os empresários brasileiros, eles queriam, eles queriam, tipo, trabalhar comigo e eles falavam assim, não, aqui é o contrato do UFC, tal, tal, tal. E realmente era um contrato do UFC, tal, tal, tal. Porque eles, eles já tinham um cara no UFC, então você assinava o contrato e eu ficava esperando. Pô, a luta, tal, tal, tal. E mentira, não era contratado do UFC. Simply paying travel expenses to get to the fights was a potential impasse in his career. So his parents, who were already working two jobs, did whatever extra they could to support him. Você imagina, minha mãe e meu pai cataram a latinha a vida inteira, mano. Latinha, papelão, para poder, tipo, fazer com que, tipo, eu e meu irmão pudessem lutar os campeonatos. But that still wasn't enough. And so they would appeal to the community. They would organize raffles and sell tickets to pay Charles travel. Minha ex-mulher na época, junto com a minha mãe, pô, foi nos mercados, pedia um ovo, caixa de bombom, tal, 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 e fizeram um bingo. Na rua. Charles' father would lie to his wife about their financial situation in order to support Charles' career. I mean, they gave everything they had. Então assim, meu pai falava, não, paguei a conta de luz. Mentira, meu pai tinha escondido, não pagava para poder pagar nossos campeonatos. And of course, Charles himself was grinding, selling whatever he could on the street while getting laughed at by his classmates. Caraca, o lutador lá, o Charles lá, e aí, Charles, queijinho, pá, minha vida inteira. In the community, Charles had his share of doubters, people who didn't think he could make it. Eu levava a fazer a rifa de alguma coisa que ele ganhava para poder juntar dinheiro. E meu, muitas vezes as pessoas falavam meu pai assim, a gente vai ajudar, Tanho, mas não vai, não chega, não vai dar, você sabe, você sabe, é outro mundo. Uh -huh. E meu pai bêbado falava assim, vocês vão ver se não vai chegar. But to be fair, some were advising him to stick to school. Mandei ele estudar, tipo, então eu escutei minha vida inteira isso, só que isso me, tipo, era o meu combustível, eu falava, pô, eu posso, eu sou capaz. So it's hard to attribute any malice to the doubters. They obviously just saw education as the safer bet. I mean, Charles himself almost got to a point where, for financial reasons, he thought it actually might not be possible. Even with all the talent and the hard work, maybe there's just no escape. Então, tipo, chega, chega um momento que você fala, pô, será que é isso, cara? Será que eu vou conseguir de verdade ter? And you know, it's not up to other people to believe in your dream. That's up to you. And regardless of what they thought, 
the community still supported Charles financially in whatever way they could. Um outro não pô, não vou poder ir, mas tá aqui 10, 5, 20, tal, tal, recadar o dinheiro da passagem e comprar minha passagem de ida. So while promoters robbed Charles and jeopardized his career in the process, his parents, his family, and to an extent the favela all stepped up here to give a kid an opportunity to beat a path out of the slum. In 2010, all the monumental sacrifices finally paid off when he was offered a real UFC contract, an emotional moment for him and his family. Ah, chorei pra caramba, né? Família inteira chorou. Pô, muita dedicação, muito sangue, muito suor, muito, sabe, muito... Upon signing, his father offered him a prophetic piece of advice. Meu pai pegou, meu pai tava sentado, os olhos cheios de lágrimas, não até hoje, eu também me emociono. Você tá assinando o um contrato do seu maior sonho, né? Do nosso sonho, do nosso maior sonho. É fácil chegar. Eu falei, pô, tô treinando desde os 12 anos de idade. Tinha 20 anos, 21 anos. E eu falei assim, foi fácil chegar? Aí ele falou, é, o difícil é a gente se manter. And that was exactly right. This was not the time for Charles to become complacent. Despite a sensational start. And we are underway. It's all over. Wow. After 16 fights in the organization, he had an imperfect UFC record of nine wins and seven losses. Not only that, but he had lost three of his last four, missing weight on two of those occasions. 150 and a half, Mr. Oliveira. 150 and a half, wow, well, that is shocking. Now, this was exactly what his father had warned about. He was now in a position where he would have to fight and claw just to keep his place in the company. Because although he was losing to elite opposition and the Holloway fight was an injury, when you factor in the missed weight, his career was in a precarious position. But instead of cutting him, the UFC forced him up to lightweight. O, o, bom, o que eu gostei disso de tudo é o que? Eu sei reinventar. Tá. Eu comecei, né? Acabou dando altos e baixos, voltou. And from there, Charles would rebuild his career in jaw dropping fashion. After a loss to Felder, Charles put together a monstrous sequence of wins, one of the greatest in lightweight history, eventually lifting the belt against Chandler and defending it in epic manner against the two men who were most tipped to inherit Khabib's throne. And his run was nothing short of sensational. This clip, he describes how it was all the more satisfying because it came at the end of such a long and arduous journey. And this soundbite must apply almost exactly to his parents in their crusade supporting their son. Mas muitos momentos eu paro em casa e eu, eu, eu choro, igual vamos pôr assim, quando meu pai pegou na mão, tipo eu chorei porque tipo foi uma coisa que a gente tipo que ele falou vai acontecer, eu falei eu te prometo vai acontecer. Então tipo eu acho que o gostinho ficou um gostinho mais melhor. And so this story, as impossible as it seems and as great as the challenges were, does have a triumphant end. Charles has been able to give back to his parents. He bought them a farm and took them out of the suffocating financial pressure cooker they had labored in for so long. Fazia tudo isso porque eu queria ter o meu dinheiro, para meu pai não precisar ficar se matando tanto. As coisas boas para eles que tipo nunca vai chegar ao pé de tudo que eles fizeram por mim pelo meu irmão e poder tipo igual ela fala, né? Ela poder hoje ter o filho campeão do UFC, campeão do mundo. Charles grew up fully aware of what it was like to not have enough food for the whole family. He knows the relentless nature of trying to make ends meet. And so now, he gives out food to hundreds of families. He also set up an academy, offering free jiu-jitsu to kids. And that is a real heartwarming full circle. He, as a child, 
was given free classes and that sent him down the epic journey we've just seen. Now, many years later, he's the one offering that to kids who are just like him. I came from a project social, so when I thought I'd open my academy, I'd give my family to my family. The first thing I said to everyone when I came to the academy, I said, I'd open a project social. The project social was very important for me at the beginning, because I think that here, the kids, sometimes they have the desire to do a sport, but they don't have the money to pay. You have the pride of being young, of being helping. But beyond the material, beyond the material, Charles offers something even greater. He has said many times the favela won, and he has explained in detail exactly what that means. Eu falo muito assim a favela venceu, né? E tipo, ah, por que a favela venceu? Porque eu sou um moleque que veio da comunidade e eu falo muito para a galera o quê? O que eu mais gosto é poder mostrar para as crianças, para os jovens, para os adultos, para os velhos, que a gente pode sim ser alguém na vida. Não só na parte do esporte, mas uhum. em tudo. Uhum. Sem você precisar fazer nada de errado. Mas eu tenho amigos que infelizmente escolheram o lado errado. Amigos hoje que já estão presos, amigos que já morreram, amigos que quando eu cheguei me abraçaram e choraram, uhum. amigos que falaram na minha cara. Eu poderia ter escolhido outra vida. E sabe o que eu falei? Você pode escolher ainda. A gente é ser humano, a gente acerta e erra. Mano, as crianças pequeninas dentro da comunidade, eu quero ser igual você. Fala, não... So Charles sees himself as symbolic of hope and representing the possibility that a life lived the right way is a path to a brighter future, one that can lead away from all the darkness and destitution of the slum. And although that is not in any way a substitute for real social and political change, it is a very powerful message that can transform lives. O cara manda lá, pô, sair da depressão com você. Pô, minha filha tava internada, mano. Eu colocava os, os seus áudios pra ela escutar, tipo, áudio que eu tava numa entrevista fazendo, colocar pra escutar, mexia. In the end, what we have is a story unlike the vast majority of stories that roll out of these neighborhoods. We hear about the crime and the poverty all the time. Almost always negative. But here, we have a story and a life that represents all the better aspects, the humanity of the real people who are forced to live there, who can't escape. In the Bible story, David had a stone. The stone Charles carries is merely symbolic. In reality, Charles' weapons were all entirely human. He had a family banded together in dire circumstances, unending support from his parents, who, no matter what sacrifices were needed, they were prepared to make them. The neighbor Paolo, who had the instinct to mentor, and the good nature to appeal for a scholarship. That first teacher, presumably not a wealthy man, who agreed to offer his services for free. He had an impoverished community step up, contributing in smaller amounts, all to offer this guy something that so many people take for granted, an opportunity. These are all the real and positive forces in the tapestry that is Charles' life. And in the end, just as David did, Charles showed everyone, he showed the world, that those things can be enough as he conquered Goliath.